Join me, 48 Hours Correspondent Erin Moriarty, on my podcast, My Life of Crime, as I take on true crime investigations like no other. This season, I'm looking into the labyrinth of crime and secrets within families. I'm cutting straight to the evidence and talking to the people directly involved, including investigators and the families of victims. Listen to My Life of Crime with Erin Moriarty wherever you get your podcasts. Inspired by the life of the savvy and ambitious Colombian businesswoman Griselda Blanco comes a new Netflix original limited series. Griselda tells the story of a devoted mother who, with her lethal blend of charm and relentless savagery, creates one of the most powerful cartels in history. Witness Sofia Vergara's captivating transformation into the godmother of the underworld. Griselda, now streaming only on Netflix. ABCs. Welcome to the Bare Naked ABCs, the only podcast with the one co-host, uh, host, single host, that reviews Bare Naked Lady songs alphabetically. As you can hear, um, Aaron is still upset by that debacle last week. He won't even come into the studio. We were supposed to have Michelle as well, but she's gone outside to hopefully coax Aaron back in. While we're waiting for things to return to normal, we are going to start a tour of the Americas with guests. And joining me tonight, we have Bill Meeks. He is a podcaster for nine years. I cannot believe that that podcasting has even existed for that long. I technically uh, invented it. <laughs> you must have. It's that like that far back. No, but I was there to steal it from the guy who did, so. Oh, okay. Well, we're talking a almost a different decade at that point. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Way back. Back in my day, we did podcasts. Why don't you tell us some of the podcasts that you have been involved in and created over these years? Oh, sure. Uh, well, I, I'd say most successfully, uh, there was the Universe Box line of podcasts, which included fan cast about uh, shows on TV like Gotham, Once Upon a Time, it was Legends of Gotham, Greetings from Storybrooke. Uh, were the shows we also had our flagship show uh universe box that was really about our community that had built up around these fan cast and, and that was a lot of fun me and my wife did it for about five years or so and lately i've been working on a scripted podcast it's a sketch comedy kind of a blend sketch comedy narrative uh called the fakest about uh, a news organization who's devoted to reporting on the fake news for real or just making it up so <laughs> I love that idea. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Um, there's actually uh, quite a few Very Naked Ladies references in there. I, I haven't done a full song yet, but there's a there's one sketch from season one where Justin Bieber's kids uh, travel back in time to punish him for you know messing up their reputation because they're Justin Bieber's kids, <laughs> and uh, they zoom in out of the time stream stream at the top of the CN Tower. And then eventually uh, they hold a benefit uh, in Nathan Phillips Square where BNL had their first concert and their lawyer sings a, a very, you know, early era Bare Naked Ladies uh, song about them. So. <laughs> nice. And that you said that's in the first season? Yeah, that's in season one. I think it's uh, in the ep- episode four, Home Despot. So definitely go out and listen to that if if you're listening to this show on a bare naked ladies fan, like go out and watch that episode. Listen to that episode. <laughs> Definitely, please do. Please do. And and I'm gonna have to go back and I'm gonna have to listen to the Legends of Gotham because I'm a huge Gotham fan. Mm-hmm. I, I had problems with this show, but I really enjoyed it at the same time. Oh yeah, um, like I, they, that's pretty much everybody. That that last <laughs> season, I even I had problems with, and I was like over the moon about that show in general (laughs) you know the last season was a little weak here and there and i thought they tried to do too much uh and didn't pay off some things as well but it is really great show still still, one of my favorite uh modern interpretations of batman one of the things i say that they that that me and my friend paul are always talking about and and pretty much agree with each other on so but you might not Mm -hmm. is the writers are really really excellent at writing villains Oh, absolutely. Not as strong on writing the heroes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the villains just shine. I mean, it's really... Oh, they do. It's really a villain show. 
But I think I think that was kind of the intention. We got the opportunity to interview John Stevens, the executive producer for that show, a couple times, and it, yeah, he he was just. He was like, we wanted to make this the villain's origin stories, you know, because you never get to really see those. And then, of course, you know, a few years later, oh, they have this big, successful Joker movie. <laughs> um, so, they probably owe a little bit of thanks to that, to, to Gotham, to kind of priming the pump. <laughs> oh, definitely. And, and having an amazing Joker on that show, like that was a very well written and well acted Joker. Oh yeah, well yeah, it was like fifteen different Jokers all played by the same guy, and it was really awesome. It was like <laughs> a, he did like a, I always went on about this on the podcast was that they pretty much did every popular Joker they did a version of, uh, and it was all the same yes. guy playing all the way throughout. <laughs> who, who was your favorite? Uh, who was your favorite? interpretation i want to say and i can never get the name right it's the second one that he comes up with the brother that is dosed with the gas oh, jeremiah um yes yeah he is my favorite version of that and interpretation of oh that. yeah he's probably the closest they got to like batman the animated series joker you know just like yeah. <laughs> smooth a, a smooth criminal <laughs> yes and very, very charismatic. Oh, definitely, definitely. You, you don't get the char- charisma with the first Joker interpretation they do, but the second one, like, they had it spot on for that charismatic Mark Hamill type Joker. Oh, yeah, the, the first one was more sort of that Grant Morrison Arkham Asylum, very disturbing Joker, you know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I, I have a theory that, that they got the rights to do Batman from the studio, and they're like, we're going to do with it whatever we want, and then at the end of this... We're gonna we're gonna bring it and we're gonna give it back to you, oh, so that you can do your movie. The, the, great segue, <laughs> sir. <laughs> Applaud it. <laughs> Thank you. So that that that's the song we're gonna be covering tonight is "Give It Back to You." It is a song off from Grinning Streak in 2013. It's an Ed Robertson song. Uh, they all, of course, play on it and all, of course, have their own pieces in. But it was pretty much written by Ed. Um, if you haven't heard this song before, then here is a brief snippet. Don't care how long it takes, I will atone for my mistakes. I will hold your heart when it breaks and give it back to you. So as you heard before, we don't really have much to add in terms of like the musicality tonight. Aaron's not here. Oh, Aaron. So we, so Michelle is saying that Aaron asked me to pass this note to you. I'm going to go back out there and call me if you need me. Okay. So anyways, um, I'm going to read Aaron's things here. So Aaron has this to say. Sadly, the fact that Give It Back to You was from Grinning Streak was spoiled for me. I would like to think I would have guessed it, though, as Ed's vocal technique reminded me a lot of Boomerang. Give It Back to You seems to have been recorded at precisely 89 beats per minute, a quirky tempo, but one that works for the song. It drives the song along at a comfortable pace, too much faster and it would have felt rushed, too much slower, and it would have put you to sleep. It's a very short song, coming in at three minutes. It's similar to the classic pop radio hits of the 60s and 70s, although the feel is quite different, sort of a country rock thing going on, which I've noticed Ed does pretty well. It's an inoffensive song, I suppose is the best word for it. It's nothing special. Give It Back to You is recorded in the key of A major. This is a good, comfortable key for Ed. You can hear he doesn't really have to stretch too much for the high notes, but he is able to float above the instrumentals with his tenor. What did you think of the the music of this song? Oh, I think it's a beautiful song. And probably my biggest impression of this song is this is the one that really made me believe in the band San Steve again. Mm. Because, you know, all in good time, uh, there were a couple good tracks on there, but it was like, this is so different. And uh, it, it was just kind of disconcerting. And then, uh, you know, I picked up Grinning Streak. And uh, by the time I got to this song, I, w- I was completely sold on them as, I, well, not a solo act, I guess a, a solo, uh, we, we, it's not a duet or a duo. It's a quad, quad, a, a 
Quadrat? <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll go with Quadrat. <laughs> but yeah, you know, it, it, it definitely made me feel, yeah, this is a lot different than the band was with Steve, but it's still a, kind of a cool thing, you know? Yeah. It's, we, so we covered For You a couple of weeks ago. This kind of has that For You kind of flavor to it. Like mm-hmm. he's he's giving it kind of a countryfied kind of feel. Oh, yeah, classic head. Yeah, the, there was a little bit of rock in there um, it, after the first verse kind of opens it up a little bit more. Mm -hmm. It's very simple instruments. Um, I wasn't able to pull anything offline. This is one of those albums where they didn't break it down song by song, what everyone played, Mm -hmm. uh, which is really sad. I love doing that and like going, oh yeah, I hear this and I hear that, but no, I really can't. I don't know if they played around with it very much actually on this album. I really hope this is the one where Kevin got to play drums. Probably not though. (laughs) No. (laughs) There isn't much for me to add musically about this song. Like it's, it is a very simple song. Yeah, it's a, um, it's a quiet song, which I think, uh, you know, sort of supports th- th- how thoughtful the lyrics are, you know, because it's a very, like, sensitive situation and everything. And I think, I think, you know, having just even that bridge, which kind of builds up a little bit, doesn't build up that much, you know? No. And, and I, I think that really supports the message because it, it feels like a song that is, you know, a quiet conversation between two people, you know? Yeah. But it's a really beautiful song all the same, and it's it just very relaxed, and, and you can kind of just re- give it, you know, listen to it and and turn your brain off and enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I do like the band when they do that. It's a, it's a good palate cleanser on that on the album. And yeah, and I, I mean, I, I've always been a big sucker for an Ed Ballad, too. You know, Am I the Only One? Great Provider. Uh, that's probably my fav- one of my favorite songs they've done, you know. <laughs> it, it, Ed, Ed does a really good ballad. I think I think sometimes, you know, just just because he doesn't have quite as strong of a, a voice as Steve, you know, he uh, on those big rocker ones, uh, you know, he, he strains his voice a little bit to kind of get that rock presence out there. But on these, he's just like easy, breezy, cool. Ed just uh, laying down some lines. And it's when his voice sounds the best. Oh, yeah, absolutely. When I Fall is another one I forgot to mention that, that yes. falls into that category, too. That one's great. I used to use that uh, as my musical audition song all the time back in the day. <laughs> it's an interesting choice for a musical audition. Well, it was slow. Let's talk about was... falling. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I picked it because it was slow and soft and easy, and I'm not a very good vocalist. So. <laughs> See, I think it's harder to sing the ballads and the slow, relaxing type music with, with the voice is holding those notes than a mm-hmm. rocker where you're just hitting note after note. Yeah, it's a, it's interesting because, yeah, the the ballads, you know, if, if your voice fails, you don't have as much noise to sort of cover up the little imperfections and stuff like that. I, but I, I, I don't know, like, I, I can always do, like, a la-da-da-da-da. That wasn't very good. But, you know, it's harder, <laughs> it's a little harder to do, like, a ba da ba da ba ba you know, uh, you know, especially to sustain that, you know, over three and a half minutes for how long the song is. <laughs> so we can't count on you to do karaoke to do ACDC or anything like that. <laughs> get, get a couple drinks in me. I, I'm sure I could probably bust out some ACDC, sure. <laughs> So kind of going back to the the palate cleanser, this is in the middle of that album, stuck right between Best Damn Friend and Mm -hmm. Keeping It Real. So it really is like you got these harder songs right around it, and it's kind of like, let's take it down a notch, turn on the candles, relax, Mm -hmm. and then we'll bring it back up again. Oh, yeah. What what track number is this again? I can't remember. Uh, Track number seven. So it's right there, literally in the middle of this album. This is totally, I was going to say this was a track seven. Like, th- this is like their modus operandi, you know, track seven, you know, the call and answer position. Yeah. <laughs> and it's funny that you say that, because I think that this is a nice companion piece to call and answer. Comparing this lyrically, this is kind of like, if you take this narrator and put it with a narrator from call and answer, mm-hmm. you have the relationship, you have the full story. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, yeah, yeah, and they're they're. I I love when they have little couplet songs like that. Like, what's it from Gordon? It's "Blame It on Me" and "Wrap Your Arms Around Me." I think I I could be misremembering my interpretation of that. That sounds but, you know, all right. Yeah, they kind of pair together. Or no, it was a. Uh, it was maybe it was "Wrap Your Arms Around Me" and the flag. I don't know. It's not important. <laughs> oh, that would be, that would even fit even more. That's true. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's just dark. <laughs> 
I remember I, I had I had this whole doctoral thesis on it back in the day. It's kind of I haven't thought about it in a while. But yeah, this is that this is that one for call call and answer. Like you, mm-hmm. so this song is that failed relationship, but it's about continuing to come back to those failed relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's this is the person that's begging to come back and begging to have the relationship continue and and go back together. Um, versus call and answer he's like no go away like well maybe well go go away. well maybe <laughs> yeah maybe this is like two fights on from call and answer or something like that for the couple you know yeah although i have to say i like call and answer a lot better than this so well i mean of course <laughs> i mean it's call and answer right like uh, you, it, it, if uh if you didn't say that i would be off this podcast because i knew <laughs> i would know i wouldn't be talking to a true fan at that point <laughs> What what are your thoughts around the lyrics of this song? I'll get to mine in a minute. Yeah, I think it's a I, I think it's a really sort of earnest song, and it really at the end of the day, uh, I think it kind of hands on the oh, what's the line? I have the lyrics printed out here. It, the whole knots can come undone implies it's a marriage, and then you know some lyrics later on in the song sort of you know suggest that you know it, th- this song to me is really about you know, the hardships that you face in a long-term relationship like a marriage and how, you know, it's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint in that mm-hmm. kind of relationship. And, and that's kind of at least the uh, perspective of the narrator here, at least in my interpretation, that he's, he's being like, come on, you know, this sucks, but we've been through stuff before. We're going to be through more stuff. Uh, you know, what is it? The dust in the attic on the floor? You know, I kind of see that as like, you know, the remnants of every other problem they've ever had. And he, he's like, come on, we can just hang on and we'll get through this like we've got through everything else, you know? Yeah. So you seem to have a better handle on on this song um, than I do. Help me help me maybe like this song a little bit more than I already do. Okay. Because I love the music for this song. The lyrics when I sit down and listen to the lyrics is where it starts to break apart for me. Mm-hmm. And I was trying to figure out why throughout the week as I listened to it for the fifty billionth time. <laughs> um, and it occurred to me like this song is full of mixed metaphors that just don't seem to make sense. And I might be starting to ruin this song for other people now. And if I do, I apologize ahead of time. Go ahead and just like fast forward on this whole section. I am personally intrigued. Continue. (laughs) So my first problem comes right in. There's several throughout the song. Mm -hmm. Um, But my biggest one, I should say, not the first one, is I will hold your heart when it breaks and give it back to you. Why one simple word would have changed this for me and made it a much more likable song for me. Who holds someone's else, someone else's heart while it's breaking? Watch it happens and the hands them back the broken heart. See, just- <laughs> very true. Like I interpreted that to be that, you know, when he says, I will hold your heart when it breaks, he, he was basically saying, I know I've hurt you. I'm hurting you right now. I will support you and then try and build you back up from this thing that I've done. You know, th- yeah. that was kind of my interpretation. And, and I get the interpretation that he's going for, but I'm like, that's yeah. a, that metaphor breaks apart like the heart. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the heart is not meant to be held in hands, uh, or at least uh, not non-trained hands. Right. I, now, if he had said, I will mend your heart when it breaks and give it back to you, that to me, like... Same number of syllables would have made a little bit more sense. Would have worked mm-hmm. a little bit better for me with the with what was going on. Yeah, yeah. So I think so. I think Ed, you need to come to me. I'll I'll be your song editor for a couple songs. We'll fix this up and, and get this back out there and make it make more sense. Well, see, that's <laughs> what he had Steve for, and then Steve had to go and you know do what happened with Steve. You know, exactly. <laughs> Um, but it wasn't the first one I had a problem with. There, there was another. Well, that was the first one in the song, actually, because the song starts right out with the chorus, mm-hmm. so which is interesting. Usually they don't tend to do that, and, and this song they decided to go with that, which is a neat start. Um, well, it seems like I feel I, like they do that more now uh, than they did, you know, back in the day, like since they w- broke off as the four piece. Uh, you know, I, I feel like they do that more like they... They they start with the hook and then they go in back into the verse like after you know they they kind of hit you in the face with the chorus. Right, we're gonna grab you. Okay, now we're gonna tell you the story and we're gonna grab you again. Mm, exactly. The first line of the first verse 
I I immediately went, what? Out of everyone, I should have known how knots can come undone. Why? 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 We have no reason to know that this person has any reason to believe or know that he should have known that that marriage and knots can come undone. Like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> what? I'm supposed to suddenly believe that you're this expert that that should have known better than anyone else in the world. <laughs> well, maybe you know, because obviously this is not the first mistake this guy has made, right? So maybe, okay. maybe, maybe he's saying, you know. Because this has happened before, you know, obviously I know that, you know, this can really break apart really easily and I'm trying to hold it together, you know? Yeah. All right. Explain this one to me then. Okay. Dust coats the floor with every move we seem to find more. Why is he finding more dust as he's moving across the floor than he had before and noticed before? (laughs) <laughs> well, when you put it like that, I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> it's a very beautiful verse, but I, I, when I sit and listen to it, I'm like, I don't get what you're trying to say here. I, I, feel, I feel like this is like one of those very sort of literary lines to me. Like the, the, the dust to me is sort of, uh, you know, the dust that is settled from the problems they've had in the past. Oh, and oh. Yeah, and you know, every move they make, every time they move past a problem, they accumulate more dust. You know what yes. I mean? Yes, and as they work, as they walk by these things and it, it, it stirs more stuff up, they seem to find more problems. Okay, I, I, makes more sense now. I like that more now. Yeah, and I feel I feel like, you know, that, that can feel like a negative thing, you know, from the outside, but I think he the character's trying to romanticize that here, you know, kind of trying to say our relationship has value because we've had all these obstacles and we'll, we're still here. Yeah. That's a very good point. I like that one. I'm going to, I'm going to bring up one more line that I, I, I get confused by and don't really like so much before I goof to the ones I do like. Okay. <clears throat> Cause I like to stop on the fin- on the positives. <laughs> Anyone can walk on water just before they drown. I'm really struggling with that line. (laughs) I can't even put words to why I struggle with that line other than the fact that are we talking about the quarter millisecond before you fall into the water (laughs) that you seem to be walking on it? Okay, so I'll try and I'll, I'll, I'll take a swing at this one too. You know, anyone can walk on water right before they drown. Like to me, walk on water implies well there's the whole like religious connotation of like jesus walking on water and it's also you know a common common saying to say that you know oh this person i i adore this person to me they walk on water you know Mm -hmm. they're they're they're, you know like jesus level you know aqua batics Uh, (laughs) but uh you know so, so my my interpretation of that is that he felt maybe he felt like she, uh, the the person he's talking to in the song, held him up uh, in a certain way, and this mistake has made him sink and drown. You know what I mean? Okay, yeah. I'm trying here. It's, I mean, ask Ed for sure, but yeah. So kind of like anyone can be idolized, but once you look past the idolization, they're going to no longer seem idyllic and they're going to, they're going to drown. They're going, if you try to hold them up to that standard that they can't meet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it all, I also think there's probably, or at least there's a hint to me of something reciprocal there. Like he can, he can maintain walking on water as long as she believes he can. And the second that she loses faith in him because of this mistake he's made, boom, drown town. All right. I, I can, I can jab with that. That works. Nice. Nice. So that that brings me to the verse I really do like, which I I want to say, and I'm going to cut it out if I'm wrong, cause I, I, but I think I'm right, is the bridge. Because I can't bring this up in my mind, like how it sounds. And uh, Should have just fell down Instead of making such a hole in the ground Oh, no, it's, it's not. It's the, it's the second verse. Yeah. There's no mistaking. I will wear the crown. I am lord and master of this disaster. Like, I really love that verse, that whole verse all together. But even like the, two, so you have two separate metaphors kind of going on that he's trying to set, take ownership of this mistake. 
separate them out. I, both of those are great metaphors and beautifully written. Um, the idea that like, instead of continuing to sit there and spin my tires and continuing to make excuses, I should have just like laid down and admitted my mistakes earlier on. But instead I just kept digging myself a bigger and bigger and bigger hole. I love that. Yeah. And they, that's like the, the, the whole message of that verse for me is just that, you know, yeah, obviously he's tried to like hide this or tamp it down or keep it from her and it's come out and he realizes that he did a lot more damage by not just being up front with her, you know, and it's a real good contrast to the verse before where it's all about like, you know, oh, I should have known this would happen. And I, oh, well, that's because of this and that's because of that. And this is where he kind of takes ownership of everything and says, no, this was my mistake. And, and I did more damage here by trying to hide it than I than I ever could have done by just admitting it. Yeah. Now, we haven't gotten to this song yet, but the song sounds a lot like, and, and to me kind of matches up a little bit with, too, with Told You So, mm-hmm. which I think I want to say also is a, a very Ed song. Um, oh, it yeah. sounds very much similar. The rhyme, rhyme pattern is very much along the same lines. But I listening to this week, I had to go back and listen to Told You So. I'm like, yeah, actually, those are pretty similar. Like, if, if it weren't for... If it weren't written by him, we may have a, a Dan Fogelberg type problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know that's interesting. You bring that because there's a, there's some uh, water metaphors and oh no, not da- Dan Fogelberg. Sorry, John Fogerty, <laughs> 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 the man who got sued by his record company for sounding too much like himself. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but told you so has so, some sort of uh, doesn't it have like some water metaphors in it too? I, yes. I'm trying to think of how it starts. Uh, I never jumped in and rescued you, but I wanted to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Th- there's some interesting parallels there for sure. Ed just likes those water metaphors. He does. Well, I mean, he's Canadian, so you know, he it, 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 all they do is drink m- maple syrup and then go out on the water. From what I've heard, because later on in the later on in this album, he has the song "Crawl." Like he just likes to stick to this metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> We've cracked the psyche of Ed Robertson, finally. <laughs> He's dealing with water issues. You had a fear <laughs> of water before coming into the song. I, 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 no, never mind. I was going to say in light of my room, wasn't there? But no, that was uh, pop and ice cream. So never mind. <laughs> Completely different. Well, no, because that's about the, that the river. about the river smelling like vomit ice cream. Yeah. 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 So I, I, we, we have, we have found the secret of Ed Robertson's lyrics. I'm going to go and write my own water song now and it's going to pull one week. Are there water references in that one. Probably Aquaman. Aquaman. Yeah. Aquaman. We, we, I now need to go back through every bare naked lady song that Ed has written and find the water reference. Nice. Do like a water super cut. <laughs> Wet bare naked lady supercut. There we go. By by the end of this podcast, I'll do that. I'll put it in every every water supercut. <laughs> nice, nice. And I will play it on repeat. <laughs> Love a good water metaphor. <clears throat> so I don't have a lot more else to say about this song. Do you have any more thoughts on this song? Well, here, uh, let me uh, think about it. I didn't take notes or anything. Let me just uh, see here. Um... No, really, I, I, I think I, I, I think I've I've said everything I have to say on it. Just, it again, just to say that th- this song, I'm so thankful for this song because this song is the one that really made me think. Oh, I can be uh, a fan of the four member Bare Naked Ladies. So, <laughs> so what was it about this song that made you feel that way? Um, just because this song made me feel like their older songs did, uh, mm. which you know nothing on All in Good Time uh, had. You know, there were there were some good songs, there were some catchy songs, but none of them like really kind of got me in the gut, got me in the heart. And this uh, one this, did. This one did. This one absolutely did. And, and I mean, there's some criticism to be had for the song. Could, it, you could say that, you know, even though he's taking ownership of this mistake, it's obvious. You know, he's made these mistakes before, and maybe he's just a screw up who always makes mistakes. And this whole song is a big justification, like some sort of narcissistic justification to his partner about it. You could say that, but it's still really kind of a sweet song. 
songs. Maybe he was actually channeling Stephen when he wrote this song. Because that is totally a Stephen way of writing songs. Maybe of that's the- why my mind goes there. I'm like, I want to I wanna see Steve's involvement in this, even though he wasn't involved. <laughs> Steven is known for his asshole boyfriend lyrics. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. One of the things I love about his lyrics. Absolutely. <laughs> so Ed was like, I can write an asshole boyfriend song. Watch this. <laughs> Watch this, Steve. You th- oh, uh, what was the, the one song they wrote that was very obviously sort of like a talking about the situation with steve i think it was on all in good time i'm trying to remember what it was called i i want to say well there were several but you run away is like the most yeah yeah obvious like (laughs) right out front it was it was the john lennon do you how do you dream of that album oh yeah yeah absolutely so so he he was like oh that one didn't land enough steve okay i'm gonna write an asshole boyfriend song So with that being said, before we get ourselves dug, dug too deep and Steven never comes on ever again, or Ed, <laughs> let's put some numbers to this. How many disasters do you give this song? So we rate it from zero to five. Zero is like the absolute worst song ever written. Mm-hmm. Five is like best, definitely in your top 100 songs ever written type song. Yeah, yeah. Zero to five. How many disasters do you give this song? Is there gradation between the points or do I have to do like a whole number? You- no, you can do gradations. We've, gradations? We've even gone okay. down to the hundredths at this point. Okay, I, I'd say 3.125 disasters. Wow, uh, you took it that one more step. Yeah, Tried yeah. down to the one-eighth. Nice. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, you know me, I'm a math person. Not at all. Not at all. Uh, <laughs> No, no, but uh, it, it, it's a really good song. Like I said, you know, it kind of brought me back to the band and I, it, it, it's just a beautiful song. I mean, it, it's not the best one they've ever written. It's not the worst. It's, it's a solid 3.125. Yeah, no, I, I can see that. Um, I myself gave it a 3.5. Like, I like this song, even though there's parts of it that before tonight didn't make a lot of sense to me. It makes a little bit more sense to me now. Um I like I told you so and call and answer a lot better. Um, <laughs> it's hard to watch the man who wrote for you write something like this when I know that he's capable of making better metaphors and making them much more clear. Yeah. Um, yeah. But at the same time, I can sit there and if I'm just putting on music to kind of relax to, this is one of those songs I could put on to relax to. And it's still beautiful, beautiful and harmonious and just nice and easy to listen mm-hmm. oh yeah and this is a uh, this is one of those ones that i'll just like scream out in the car uh when i'm driving around to it, it, it's a really good car song <laughs> so aaron has this to say i gave another spin a 3.25 and i didn't like this one quite as much apples and oranges really as they are very different songs but having said that i would seek out another spin to listen to again before I give it back to you so Taking that into account, I give give it back to you a very respectable 3.2 rating out of 5. Certainly above average. Not a bad tune, but not one of my favorites. So I have a couple of appearances for tonight. Um, there's a really great YouTube video of Ed and Jim working on their harmonies together. Uh, it's not for this song, uh, but just watching them kind of work on how to write those harmonies and sing those harmonies is really kind of fun to watch. Um, So I definitely recommend that. And then the other one that I have, because I decided to put in two tonight, is one that came up recently, like within the last six months. Um, And I think it is a beautiful way to show that what this band really can do beautifully together um, is when they went on the AV club, Uh, earlier this year and they played in the air tonight so people who don't know the av club collects a set of song list uh each year and then they have the list and throughout the year they'll invite bands on however long it takes the bands to come on they have whatever's left on the list and when bare naked ladies came on they decided the quartet the quartet there we go we got the right word quartet that's it um by George, I think you've got it. <laughs> when the quartet came on, they covered In the Air Tonight. And it is, it's like a beautiful bluegrass version of 
a song that I love to begin with, I actually love this revisioning of it better than the original. Oh, wow. So I'm going to post that up on tonight's links as well. I recommend everyone go out and listen to it because it is such a... I've actually downloaded it onto... You know, I've, I've unofficially downloaded it because, you, you know, there's no buyable version of it yeah. um, onto my iPod just so I can listen to it while I'm, while I'm doing work around the house. Well, they always do such a great job with 80s songs too, like Careless Whisper, Material Girl, uh, When Doves Cry. McDonald's Girl. What, what was that? McDonald's Girl. Oh, yeah, yeah. Stone Cold <laughs> Classic right there. Yes. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so we talked a little bit about Bare Naked Ladies, the quartet. I want to go a little bit toward the other side real quick. Um, I recommend if you guys live in Canada, especially Ontario, uh, We er, last year we talked about, well, the whole Bare Naked Ladies, but Stephen wrote the music for the Stratford Von Avon uh, con- uh, no, Stratford in Canada in Ontario, their their theater uh, shows that they do, um, and he's actually done three more since himself solo. Last year they closed it, rebuilt the theater that they're doing the Stratford um, the Stratford Festival. Um, they rebuilt the whole theater around that, and they're reopening it next summer. And Stephen has actually written his own musical with a, with the help of another person that will be premiering at the Stratford Festival next year. I am so excited for this. You have no idea. <laughs> I wish I had the time and the money to go out and see this. It sounds like it's going to be an amazing thing. And like to have that festival be the one where it premieres, mm-hmm. um, it's, it's going to be called... Is it Here's What It Takes? Here's what it takes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Just as you said it, I found it. On the <laughs> <laughs> yes. Here's what it takes, which comes off from his Discipline One mm-hmm. album. Um, so I'm interested to hear what other songs he throws into there um, for the story that, that's going on on this. It's called Here's What It Takes. It charts the musical highs and living the lows of, the, of a rocker duet on their journey from performing at a children's birthday parties in the 80s to the top of the pops in the 90s, and then on the rocky road of the new century. I wonder where he got the idea for this. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't sound similar to anything at all. No, but it, like that's what why I'm so excited about it. You know, if it was just, you know, a Stephen Page musical, cool, I'll get the score whenever. But this one, this uh, with that kind of story in it, like I want to be there live and, and see this thing, you know. Definitely. And so if you live in Canada, definitely go to it. Matter of fact, if you go to this, if you personally go to this, like, please, like, come on and give us a review or anyone else. If you if you don't anyone give us a review of what this what this is. Yeah. Let me tap back to those Canadians you just called out. If you have a sofa I can crash on, that will make this a lot easier. So get a hold of me at Bill Meeks on Twitter. (laughs) (laughs) And, And to you Canadians out there that live in Ontario, if you say you're Canadian. And you say that you love Bare Naked Ladies and you don't go to this. I want you need to pass in your Bare Naked Ladies ticket right now. Like you, you, you're no longer a fan. And your Sorry. Canadian <laughs> citizenship, obviously. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Every Canadian <laughs> should be going to this. It should be required. Like, you know, like high school, like it, there's a requirement to go see this musical. Um, with that being said, I want to pass it over to you real quick. Give us some plugs. <laughs> Bill, where can people find you? What can they look you up? Okay, uh, sure. Uh, so, so like I said, we're doing the fakest. Um, it might not be out by the, or it, it'll probably be out before this episode comes out. But we're doing the season finale, a big, bold, boisterous thing called Operation Devastations, part parts one and parts two, where every villain that uh, the main character Paul Defoe, who I play. Uh, has ever created throughout his life descends on the studio in this one big bombastic thing. So it's a lot of fun. Uh, check that out. We also do a weekly uh, show, shorter version of the show called Fakest News Headlines, where you don't have to follow a plot. It's just a bunch of you know quick sort of onion style gags. Uh, you can check that out. And I'm also I'm launching a company here in November called Do Anything Media. And if you like creating stuff. Uh, with other people online, uh, I definitely check that out. You can follow it at Do Anything Media on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or Do Anything Media. 
they, the website up there right now isn't that great, but a better one will be up in a couple weeks. And I'm going to throw out a couple more for you because, <clears throat> oh. you know, you, I want people to go out and get as much of you as possible, especially if they enjoyed listening to you tonight. You're also the author of the Dog Boy series. Is that correct? That is correct. The Do- Dog Boy Adventures. Yeah. Yes. So go out and buy those books. Those are great. Um, Bert is evil. So I, I, you know, I have long held the idea that Bert Reynolds was evil, but you, you did finally find proof of my theory that Deliverance was actually really bi- autobiographical. Was that what, what this is about? No, 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 no. Wrong Bert. Wrong Bert. Oh. Sesame Street Bert. Is evil. Oh, that bird! That bird's evil. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it, it's a, it's more of a sort of like long form article. Um, but it's all about one of the internet's first viral sensations, a website called Bird is Evil, that eventually caused, uh, you know, international protest, and you know, people got jailed for using stuff from this site. It's, it's a crazy story. I, I highly recommend checking it out. It's only ninety nine <laughs> cents too. So. <laughs> We've actually talked about that on this show before, so that's great. Nice. Um, and then tell us a little bit about The Trials of King Sparrow. Like, I was just reading a little bit about that earlier. Uh, the Trials of King Sparrow, it, it's actually probably one of my favorite things I've ever written. It's a it's a fairy tale about this uh, this King Sparrow. You know, he's the king of his, his people, uh, his host, as you say in Sparrow terms. And uh, in the first couple, or in the first chapter of the book... Uh, he gets betrayed and injured and separated from his host, from all his entire you know kingdom, and it's all about him sort of fighting his way back to them. And, and oh, so, really? yeah, it's part so it's part fairy tale and then sort of part Disney nature documentary where he has like a a knockdown drag out fight with a squirrel or a fox or you know all that kind of stuff. So it, it's all very visceral and uh, uh, fun. Uh, but yeah, if you like fairy tales and a little bit of violence here or there, definitely check it out. So does he go through a lot of traveling in this? Yeah, uh, basically, you know, they're flying south for the winter. So they're about halfway uh, down the country, down America way. And that's when he gets separated. And he he has to make it the rest of the way by himself. Oh, wow. So he's kind of doing his own little separate globe trotting. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Speaking of globe trotting, next week, that's the song we're going to cover. Oh, it was a segue. <laughs> <laughs> I had to really stretch for that one. That was that was a hard one. You can't work globetrot into a into a normal conversation. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming on, Bill. Tonight it's been a lot of fun. Oh, definitely I, a blast. I'd be happy to come back anytime, mostly unless I'm going to see a movie or something. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you, you don't do that very often at all. Oh no, 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 just no. a couple times a week. Only for the really big ones, like like Jay and Silent Bob reboot. Exactly, exactly. Which I'm sure, I'm sure your audience probably doesn't care about. We can talk about it after we're off air. <laughs> well, thank you very much for coming on. It was a great pleasure, and yeah, we'll have you on again. Excellent. Looking forward to it. I and I know uh, what song's coming up next, and that's one of my favorites. So I'm very excited. <laughs> well, have a good night. You too. And. For everyone else listening, thanks. That was fun. Thanks, that was fun. Don't forget, no regrets. Except maybe one. To celebrate joining Pantheon Podcasts, Rock Camp, the podcast, the official podcast of Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp, is giving away a guitar signed by Mike Portnoy of Dream Theater, Marty Friedman, formerly of Megadeth, and legendary shredder Zach Wilde. Plus, our rock star counselors like Vinny Apice, Monty Pittman, and more. To enter to win, simply follow, rate, and review our podcast on your preferred platform, and that's all you have to do. For more information, go to rockcamp.com forward slash podcast.